Thanks for joining us for another episode of Rock Hills Theater Educational Series, Mastering the Craft. This is one of many sessions like this covering all aspects of theater, from acting to sets, lighting and costumes, pretty much anything you can, we can share to help you master this craft. Today, we are focusing on the Techie Trilogy, and this specific series of this episode is set design. And my name is Alex Pena, and I'm a board member of the Rock Hill Community Theater, and I'm thrilled to be joined by our special guest, who's going to walk us through the design process of creating a set for a stage production. He's gonna give us some tips and tricks on how you can shine, and he's had the privilege of designing over 270 productions, and now takes residence, occasionally in Rock Hill, um, Dr. Bradley Sabelli. So thanks for joining us. So now before we get to all the tips and tricks, um, we wanna kind of get started with maybe, before we get started into set design, if you wanna tell us a little bit of how you got to where you are today and a little bit of uh, your background and bio. Okay, um, it's really interesting. Uh, as an artist, uh, my first inclination way back in high school was to be an art teacher. And uh, of course, that fellow by the name of Mr. DeFurio had me paint paintings and drawings and everything else. And by chance, he happened to be in charge of the backstage stuff for the drama club, as it was known back then. And so I got involved painting backdrops for the theater. And that's when it started. Uh, it also started uh, way, way back in the Butler Community Theater very similar to an operation that you have here. Although they had their own building, it was an old barn and everything else. When they discovered that I was proactive as an art person and did backdrops and paint things for the high school, all of a sudden I started doing things at the community theater. And uh, that was it. Uh, there was no turning back. And it started from that point to where I'm at today. It did help to have a show business, I, uh, you know, a show business family. My, my father was in show business and his sister and my grandmother. So I was always, in fact, I was born on the road in Niagara Falls, <laughs> New York. Uh, my dad was touring. So uh, I always was part of the show business life. It never, it's always been part of me. And then uh, <clears throat> in order to sustain a living, uh, one had to get a degree in education, and then I started that whole uh, length of time, the procedure of you know receiving five degrees and getting my doctorate at the end, uh, and then teaching. Uh, so uh, at George Washington University, as, as you may have read my bio, been there 40 some years as a professor, uh, uh, university professor emeritus uh, in residence. Um, and um, but that doesn't mean I have to be there every day. Uh, we do podcasting. So my other side of me is the professional side. Uh, in the process of learning to do theater, producing theater from the West Coast to the East Coast, you all of a sudden get these production offers and then you become a union member. Uh, so I'm a member of the United Scenic Artists Union uh, and the American Federation of Musicians and uh, was the founding member and president of the United States Institute of Theater Technology, which most theater people in tech theater should know all about because that's where you get jobs and that's where you learn how to do things and they have conferencing and you need to go do it. So that's really the whole thing in a capsule. That's how I got to be a theater artist and that's why I still am. And I love every moment of it. Uh, now, Having said that, uh, as part of this introduction, uh, it's not an easy chore to make a living in the world of theater. Uh, it's not easy. But if you have persistence, preservation, you, you, you can do it if you're persistent at it. Uh, and you are willing to adapt to situations, you can be successful. Um, and uh, eventually you can make a living out of it that's i have uh, i've survived i always say this uh, i'm so so blessed to be able to make a living by pretending 
<laughs> you know, how many people can pretend and make a living at it? Uh, that's amazing, and I love it. Uh, so art, it's not just theater. Uh, art, to me in general, is ways to take your creative prowess one step further and share it with everybody else. Um, and oh, by the way, it's nice to make money while you do it. So that's my quick bio, Alex. Uh, you asked me and I, I presented that to you. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it's definitely nice that you have like so much experience in this. Um, that being said, what does it mean in the world of theater? What does it mean to be a techie and kind of the many roles that happen behind the scenes and the general overview in like a five minute spiel of like, what is it to be a techie? For a couple of people have joined us um, and just for future audience members to see this. Well, um, and, and when we say techie, it's sort of a, a misdemeanor. It's not, it's not necessarily tech. Um, there, there is a division behind the scenes between the technical aspect and the design aspect. There's the USA Union and there's IOTSE Union. There's two different union organizations all, all working together, <clears throat> but they have different purposes. Um, the technical theater aspect supports everything that the designer initiates. The designer then has to support everything that the director initiates for a production. And the big initiator is the guy that's got the cash, the producers. Uh, those are the people you got to satisfy, not just the director. And the technicians don't just have to satisfy me. You have a technical director as somewhere along the line. Usually it's a production company that builds scenery. Um, that's what you call the technical director organization. They have to come in under budget. Everybody's supposed to look to the producer uh, for financial guidance and when he's going to say, net, no more. Okay. Or go for it. Um, so uh, behind the scenes, uh, in terms of uh, actual living uh, and learning, you're always learning. Behind the scenes, there's no such thing as an accomplished scene designer that knows everything. It doesn't work that way. Uh, you're constantly evolving a new concept every time you do a show. And, and we all know, and I'm sure everybody who's watching this, theater is not a singular art. It's not a private art form. It's a, it's a collaborative uh, process. Uh, on the other end of my house, I have my art studio. And my, my collaboration when I'm painting paintings to go in uh, galleries is me. I collaborate with myself. But in theater, you've got all kinds of personalities. You got all kinds of issues and you got different venues. As you see up on the screen, this is an empty theater. That's a proscenium stage. You might not be there. You might be in another facility. The other thing that is very important, everybody, and, and again, I'm going to address this to Alex since you asked me the question, is uh, you never would think personality conflict is a problem, but it is. Um, and I'm going to share this with you and everybody I might get some feedback if anybody sees this. Um, but if a director says to me, oh, you're my designer, you know what I tell him? No, I'm not. I quit. I am no, no director is going to tell me that they own me, okay? Because you don't. It's the script that owns everybody. It could be Tennessee William. It could be uh, Aristophanes. Uh, it could be Shakespeare. It's the play that owns everybody. It's, it's what is interpreted by everyone. So, um, and that only happened once or twice in my life. And I was really glad that I made those choices. Didn't affect me. I, I, I survived. Um, and I usually seek those people out who have that very open mindset. So working behind the scenes, Alex, is not just, okay, I got to, I got to put three pieces of two by four together and make a platform, or I got to hurry up, paint a backdrop, or this has to be had, this has to happen. We got a rehearsal coming up. It's more than that. It's, it's, it's the interaction of human beings. Like we're doing now with Zoom, most of everything that happens in, in our production processes today 
arise at a distance uh, a thousand miles away or 200 miles away or across town. Uh, we don't necessarily sit in the same room, uh, although it'd be nice. Uh, but the idea of doing theater is that collaborative process behind the scenes that is driven by the script. So there you go, Alex. That's what goes on behind that. The tech is what to expect. Yeah, I know it's a pretty loaded question to ask what is technical theater and what all kind of happens in that. Um, so now with that being said, we can kind of approach some more specific tasks and kind of topic of set design. Um, you've had a lot of experience with set design and being a designer for different productions. So I know you had um, the production of King Lear that you had prepared for us. So if you wanted to share images that you had um, by sharing your screen with us so we can look and you can kind of walk us through the process of how you approach that production and yeah. what you kind of the steps you took. Um, so if you wanted to go ahead and share your screen with us um, on here for us. Yeah, um, uh, before I even start, the, the, this is uh, one of three different venues that we talked about. Um, and speaking of venues, uh, before I go right into King Lear, which was produced in Washington, D.C. in 2017, um, being a, uh, uh, a, the chief civilian designer for the Spirit of America, which was, was produced by the U.S. Army, for 27 years. Uh, in those 27 years, I was in 27 different venues, and each one was a sporting arena. <laughs> it's like, oh God, we're in Pittsburgh, you know, we're in uh, wherever the uh, the hockey team plays there in Pittsburgh, or we're up in Albany, New York, or we were in Philadelphia, or wherever. Um, we're always in some kind of a, it was a huge sports arena and you'd have 15,000 people and you're watching this thing. And it was an arena stage because, well, actually it was three quarter rounds, it was a thrust. All these people were looking at the action. Well, you have to prepare for that venue. And uh, having said that, if you look on the screen, I, I don't know, can you see my arrow? You can't see the arrow, right? Moving. Okay, yeah. I can, which is good because that tells me where I'm going. I'm glad you can't see it. So I guess we can kind of just, we'll kind of bounce back and forth and um, you can kind of just tell us about the process. So I guess my first question to you is when you first are approached with someone about a show, what's the, where's your starting point as a designer for production? The, well, the first thing that uh, will occur um, is understanding the uh, ramification of the costs of the of the project how much does it cost how much is my budget uh, that's the first thing that we're going to see the next thing we're going to do is identify with where that space is are we going to be in a theatrical environment that's going to require x amount of dollars for backdrops um, is it going to require uh, an entire stagehand staff, a whole tech staff. Uh, that's that's the things that you ask at first to inquire. Once we get that done, you uh, <clears throat> then are introduced to all the basic uh, artists involved in the production. All those people who are uh, uh, going to be involved, your scenic designer, your lighting designer, your costume designer, and indeed, if you are a <clears throat> a scenographer where you're going to design sets, lights, and costumes, uh, you will predominantly be working with uh, uh, the director uh, in just about every aspect. That's very difficult to do. I've only done a few shows where you design sets, lights, costumes, and, and of course that includes props. Uh, so that becomes uh, an interesting issue. Uh, because you, um, you're, you're, you're caught up in time. How much time do I have to do all these elements? But today we're just going to talk about the stage design. So once I know sort of the ballpark figure of where that budget is going to be, uh, and the director knows that, then we're off to the races. We sit down and discuss what exactly we do uh, as, um, as a production team. What, for an example, the director in this case, Leslie Jacobson, she's a, 
uh, a feminist theater director uh, producer. She has her own company in the Washington metropolitan area called the Horizons Theater. Uh, and <clears throat> her concept was very different than all the other concepts that you watch or you view. And, uh, and let me tell you, when you have a, uh, a play, you better read it four or five, six, seven times, and you come back and say, okay, this is what I think it's about. What you think it's about and what the director thinks it, it's about are two different things. So uh, what might happen in this case is the director uh, will say, this is about an emotional King Lear. This is about a person who is uh, on the verge of losing his kingdom. Not that it's been taken away by a scourge, not that it's been taken away by a war, not that it's been taken by, away by any physical thing, but it's an emotional thing. Now, this director uh, eluded something and, and gave us a little hint as to what she thought King Lear was about, the personality, and that he was entering senior dementia. Uh, in his old age, he was beginning to lose confidence and control of his kingdom. He was beginning to question his the love of his three daughters, how much they loved him, uh, and questioning their uh, his son-in-laws. Uh, and then pretty soon the whole world was going to collapse around him. Uh, so we couldn't really see uh, all of what we really wanted to be seen in 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 uh, in his mind, so uh, and what I'm looking at, unfortunately, you can't see it. Is the eyes of King Lear as he's looking up into the sky, and you could see that he's lost. How do I do that as a designer? How do I make his thoughts as being lost? Well, there's several ways to do it. One is color. Uh, the other way to do that could be through the use of uh, uh, certain prop elements that reflect his personality. And that's something that we gave a lot of thought to. So the director leaves us at the end of the, actually the first production meeting with the director's concept. Um, and, you know, everybody presents a director's concept. Um, and that's what's very important. Once we know what that director's concept is, we can then be able to identify the pros and cons of what I need to do. In this show, uh, we have uh, a considerable amount of action that takes place everywhere and anywhere, interior, exterior, um, and on the way from one castle of one abode to the other. And that meant that we had to create all kinds of uh, unique images uh, in that. Uh, and those images sometimes could not be built um, as a forest. So you rely on the lighting designer who creates that. So these are conversations that have to happen uh, in order for us to be, um, in order for the production to uh, make any kinds of sense in, 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 in that. So I then had to sit back and look at 24, uh, basically 24 environments down to 17. Seven of the scenes were played over again in the same spaces, but we had 17 different environments that had to be created. How does one do that? Well, you do something that and my choice was, um, it's not gonna be realistic. Uh, it's going to have some psychology involved. Um, and what we wanted to do with the production, uh, what I wanted to do with the production is give it a sense of uh, flexibility uh, so that we had stage hands who would bring on uh, 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 pikes with the banners rather than moving a castle on stage and the banners represented the location you see. So 
What I elected to do is stylistically is do what we call a minimalist stage design. Uh, I love minimalist design. I do a lot of that. Um, and in the design process, minimalist design, you provide all the basic elements and then you add and subtract to those elements. Um, and that's exactly what we did. Well, we had a series of thrones, um, uh, 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 furniture that was made uh, and brought on stage, rolled on stage, if you will. Um, and that uh, certainly gave a, um, uh, I, a rather ease of movement, entrance and exit of, of furniture. The actors came from stage right and stage left. Now, what kind of venue was this? This was a proscenium thrust stage or three quarter round stage. And uh, if, I'm, if I have some high school and college students, they're very much aware of what a proscenium arch is. Uh, this is a proscenium thrust that has the combinations of both, partial th thrust and par partial proscenium arch. And these two things come together. So that's a plus for me because I had a fly tower. So I was able to fly in um, a backdrop or app. What it was was a tapestry of King Lear's kingdom. And one platform, a rather huge platform, irregularly shaped. And that was designed to represent his kingdom as well on the floor. Now, in order to accomplish all this, I went into um, uh, a computer generated uh, artwork because it was rather quick to be able to change things uh, using um, uh, Adobe Paint Shop. Uh, and I used that uh, and I created the various environments that I'm looking at on my screen at the moment. Um, and uh, I was able to change the light sources and the images uh, as well. Now, when you present that to a director, they can see every action moment occurring uh, in a relatively short amount of time. And then you give it an ambiance of color and three dimension and everything else. So what kind of tools does a designer have to work with? Well, when I started out in the 60s, my tools were um, a drafting table, uh, an architect's rule uh, in, your, in your various drafting pencils, in a, in a, uh, a T square and a 30, 60, 90, and have at it. Uh, today, we use AutoCAD, um, uh, and that's the principal uh, software package that we use. And, um, and I know Alex is a, 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 an architect, so he knows how to work with that. Uh, but then you marry that with uh, 3D modeling programs um, that present it in terms of color and beauty and then you present it. Uh, and what's nice about it, I was able to talk to people like we are with Zoom, and we're looking at the image, which unfortunately we're not at the moment, uh, and I can move things around while we're talking. So Leslie said, well, what happens if we move the thrones a little off center? I said, okay, I go over there and just slide the thrones off center. She says, oh, I like that. Uh, so once we identified where everything was supposed to be, uh, we were able to uh, uh, place in place all these particular elements. Uh, now, what I'm looking at in my screen is uh, some of the other bits and pieces that uh, we have. And that is the floor plan and the draftings and the other elevations that are necessary to make the show uh, happen. This is where it's all linear, it's all mathematics. So you have uh, a floor plan, which I think everybody is, or ground plan that is familiar with. And then you have what we call a section, cross section or a sectional um, of the space. Um, and that's also important to have. Uh, so uh, when we uh, have all these elements in place, all these uh, materials to discuss, the technicians can now build the show. Those are the 
quote unquote, the techies or the, or the carpenters, uh, the people who do the painting, the, the, the uh, charge painter, uh, the props master, all of this information is given to them uh, and then they can then begin construction. Now, how do I derive at that? Well, <clears throat> because we needed banners, I created a whole series of banners, uh, suggestions, and I did it with pastel. And uh, uh, somebody must have it on there, am I correct? Yes, I believe Helene is sharing her screen since we had a couple images. So she's okay. sharing while you're speaking. We're just kind of, from what you provided to us, kind of pull that. So oh, that yes, kind of yes. Yeah, a lot of that is what I'm looking at now. Yeah. Uh, what you're looking at now, and, and unfortunately, my, my screen is so small, I can't barely see it here, and I, I'm afraid to enlarge it. Um, that which you see in front of you is a uh, computer generated image uh, of King Lear. This is what I was talking about. Those are banners that we had at first thought we could fly them in, but we elected not to do that. So instead we would create them as a series of um, uh, banners on pikes that we would set down uh, on the floor. Now, if you notice, and that's great, Alex, you, you, you could be my eyes for me moving around on the, uh, on the screen there. I see your little arrow going. Um, this is, uh, again, a computer generated idea, and we could change the light sources and everything. Uh, Alex can't do that, but I, I was doing that back then, to move and generate ideas that were more comfortable with that particular environment. Can you go to another one there, Alex? Uh, yeah, I, in fact, if you could uh, take me to, yes, some of those models. Can you, can you click on the, any one of those, like that one that's sort of green, or, or, or you could see them all there, right? That's a whole series, am I correct? When you take a look at these yeah, we models, have one that's just the green specifically. Yes, okay. So when we take a look at, there you go. If we take a look at that model, um, that particular model is done. And incidentally, uh, the studio, when I had designed this, uh, we have a theater, a miniature theater in half inch scale. And we have miniature uh, lighting systems that go in there. Um, and what I needed to have done is uh, create certain illusions that I couldn't personally paint, but a lighting designer could. So uh, Mr. Uh, Michael uh, Jatan, who was a PBS lighting designer and he freelance theater designer, I says, Michael, can you give me some gobos or in television ease called cookies? Um, and create the illusion of foliage or the illusion of smoke at a battlefield and whatever. And he just went crazy. So the projections of all that would appear all over my uh, tapestry and also the ground cover of the platform that you see there in front of you. So uh, <clears throat> I, had the, I had two assistant designers and I said, okay, let's make several models. And they went, oh no, how many do we got to do? I said, as many as it takes. Um, and they did, they created a few of them. And we had then selected each of these to represent the environment. And those that were selected were presented at uh, the, the production meetings. Now, let me say this. Uh, if you don't do a production meeting, you're dead in the water. Uh, uh, by uh, contract, my production meeting here was once a week for two hours. Uh, and then anything after that was presented through JPEG file emails and back and forth. So I would get emails at two o'clock in the morning from the shop. We have a problem here. Uh, we don't know how to build, but how tall do you want this throne? If you can, Alex, can you go to those pictures of the thrones? Uh, there you go. Uh, yeah, go to the, that's at the one in the middle there. Mm -hmm. That's it. Uh, so I would generate some ideas of the thrones and then they would be regenerated and then we'd be able to select which ones do we want. Um, 
based on the artist concept and based then on the drafting, if you can go to, I think you have the set of plans. Am I not correct, Alex? Maybe you could show us uh, the drafting of, Yeah. there you go, right here. There you go, right there. So you could see what happens there. Uh, the, this is all done in AutoCAD, uh, that those people knew exactly what the build to within about, we try to keep it to within a 16th of an inch tolerance. Um, in some cases, maybe an eighth of an inch. Uh, but once that was accomplished, they knew what to build. If for some reason, and it, it did occur, that the unfinished throne was used in a rehearsal and that was intentional. So the, the, uh, King Lear could sit down and he's only five nine, I think he was five foot nine to sit down and he discovered that his legs didn't meet the floor. So then we had to do a footstool. So he didn't look like a little baby up there uh, in this big throne. Um, so, you know, these things happen. Well, as it turned out, uh, the director said the throne is too tall. The back is too tall. So we had to cut it down. So we cut that down. But these are the things that I would get at one o'clock in the morning. Um, I would get all these uh, bits and pieces uh, that would pre be presented to me. Uh, now, once that happens, uh, we're, we understand the furniture and whatever. Now, if you can, uh, Alex, go to the floor plan and the cross section. I think that's, uh, I think it's there somewhere. Uh, yeah, that's a floor plan, okay. Now the floor plan was, it's relatively simple because we don't have anything moving. We have, and this is done in, in half inch scale. Uh, incidentally, the standard scale in theater modeling is half inch equals a foot. Uh, and there are variables, particularly if you've been doing certain construction work. So we have the platform, we have the King Lear throne, all this is there, but now the lighting designer, he is going to need a cross section or a section view. And I think that's the next one to your right there, uh, Alex, you'll see a section of the theater. Uh, and uh, there it is. Uh -huh. And in this section, uh, it shows you, and you'll see uh, this little gentleman, uh, this, 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 this icon of a human uh, behind the throne, it gives you an idea of the scale. And as I said, it was a proscenium thrust. Here behind is the elevation, uh, is the fly tower with all the rigging. Uh, and out there is the three quarter round auditorium and the three or four lighting positions that were available for uh, him to, to light. What we're doing here, ladies and gentlemen, is presenting the best big picture you can of what it is that I am trying to produce as a as the as the visual artist uh, of the production piece uh, and that comes with some intrepidation too uh, you know there's there's things that have to be modified and things that have to be changed but also we need to talk to the lighting designer when I'm not there my cross section and my floor plan and my heights or elevation of platforms will tell him everything he needs to know technically not not from a director's point of view now alex if you can go you'll see some uh, uh design images of the throne and the chairs and everything i don't know if you could there no uh it's computer generated uh i don't maybe i didn't give it to you uh, well no there you go. Yeah, there's the throne. We'll use that one. Uh, I'm looking at all the furniture, but you see, we had to hurry up and quickly create this footstool for the king uh, because it was used. And and we did. I decided to do blue because blue to me means that he's his emotions are lost. He he's not he's not with the rest of the world. So color uh, is introduced uh, in production. There is a big 
to do about what you know stain of wood would we do and how we would create that and so forth uh, but you know that changes uh, so you have to know as a scenic designer um, you 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 really do have there you go thank you that's the page I'm on you really have to know the uh, subjective uh, or the the the, the uh, additive mixing of color and the subtractive mixing of color, which lighting designers have to deal with. But I have to know what's going to happen to my color if he or she is changing that with the colored gel. So stage design is also a science. It's just not like, OK, we're just going to put some stuff together and have a lot of fun and paint. Um, it is that, too, but it's more it's more qualified and it's more um, uh, uh, thought everything is thought through uh, more con more conventionally now if you can go to alex uh, again any of the um, images of the production itself uh, there you go all right i think that's the same one i'm looking at at the moment yes uh, when you look at that production uh, design, you could see <laughs> everything holistically. By that I mean the sets, the lights, the costumes, the masks, the props, uh, and the actors, <clears throat> all the entities that are required to make up this 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 production, this composition. Um, and <clears throat> King Lear is sitting at the throne. And he's staring above and looking above everybody. All of his attendants are there. That is his uh, habod. That is where he is to be. Now, if you noticed, we did make a change. And that was required by the director. She didn't want me to do blue. She wanted purple or violet, which was the color uh, of nobility and regal color of the time. So I said, okay, fine, change the color. It didn't bother me. And you could see that behind his shoulders there. Um, little things like that, uh, the director needs to be more satisfied and really felt like she was participating in changing things. And I said, go for it, Leslie, whatever you want. But you can see the banners over here on stanchions behind uh, the, the act, couple actors here. And if you will, back down here to the King Lear close up of him looking up into the sky. Uh, you just there, there. Oh, we could, there he is right there. Let's just go to that one. Okay. Uh, when we see him in that pose, and this was what I was talking about earlier. Uh, here we have a man who is looking up to the sky in a sense of, I'm not sure that I understand who I am and where I am and what's going on with all the surroundings. You'd look at his eyes. I studied uh, King Lear options of all kinds of different movies. I watched them from the 30s to conventional motion pictures of the 20th century and other plays, excerpts. And there's no reason why you can't, that's not cheating and try to deduce where the director was coming from and losing his memory. Uh, but Ellen Wade, who incidentally uh, made, been in the movies and, and television, he had several different roles, uh, played it rather convincingly, very exquisitely. Uh, and just looking at his eyes in that moment was exactly what I was looking at in my father's eyes when my father passed away, he had Alzheimer's. So I really identified almost immediately with Leslie's concept as her mother had the same disease as my father. And we were right away on the same page as a scenic designer and director. We knew all the anguish and the problems and the issues that would happen with this. And we felt that this is probably uh, an interesting take on King Lear that, that some of the other movies and, and plays that I viewed and uh, reviews of plays did not pick up. Uh, now, uh, although we're going to talk about costumes in a later session, when we take a look at this, we're going to find that this is not conventional Elizabethan garb. Uh, perhaps the only thing is, is the crown, but everything is sort of a, 
uh, uh, sort of a mystery, maybe 20th century, maybe not in terms of costume. If you go to the pictures, there you go. Let's get everybody in that scene again. So when you look at the entire company, uh, and I think we're looking at the same one, yes, we are, you'll see another, you'll see him pointing at the court gesture uh, off to the left. Very good. I see that. Um, and you could take a look at all these costumes and it's somewhat even eclectic. Now, let me say something. A scene designer needs to know what actors wear. Uh, and the reason why they need to know what they wear, I need to know if it's a double hoop skirt coming down a spiral staircase and ain't going to work if the staircase isn't wide enough. A double hoop skirt is the type of skirt that Maureen O'Hare wore in Gone with the Wind, for those of you who might want to remember that motion picture. Really wide hoop skirt. Uh, so designers need to know what exactly is going on with the costume designer, and they have to be on the same page with you, and we both have to be on the same page with the director. So talking our way through um, the play, uh, we come back to uh, the empty stage um, and what happens on that empty stage. Uh, and I think you might have a picture of that, I'm not sure. But that proscenium thrust stage, uh, or if it's a, 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 a proscenium arch, like a Lisner Auditorium, a facility like that, uh, that space dictates a lot of what you have to work with in terms of um, movement, in terms of projections, in terms of sound baffling and acoustics. Uh, and you could go, if you can, Alex, just go to one of the uh, uh, computer modeling images that I have there. Uh, it, it, one of the simpler ones would be fine if you have it. I think you do. I'm looking at it. Uh, and when you take a look at these pieces, you um, have to analyze what's all going to work for you. How is this all going to fit? Where am I going to place the banners in the wings? Where do the actors make their entrances and exits? Uh, and uh, in all the models uh, that we have, and again, I think you even have some of those, those models are even a better indication of whether something's going to work or not because they're done in scale. Uh, you can pick any one if you could find all that whole series, that'd be great. Uh, and when you look at those models, um, any one of those will help the director understand better what she's dealing with, with moving bodies across stage. Timing is important. Uh, you know, people don't think about clock, but there is a clock. Um, and it's an internal clock. It, it goes on. The stage manager, she starts with the stopwatch and starts and stops and action takes place. The, same, the, the stage designer, uh, in this case, it wasn't quite the problem because um, uh, the dressing room was very close relationship to the stage design. But in many plays, the stage designer's got to provide a space for costume changes behind the action, behind the set. Uh, so, you know, you begin to think about how beautiful the big picture is, but then you have to look at all the incidental activity that has to be accomplished. The rehearsal report that happens at the end of every night uh, is presented, usually I would get that about two o'clock in the morning. The, the stage manager is the one job that is absolutely critical to the success of a production in in process that stage managers runs everything they handle the whole operation they make sure that everything is working on time during the rehearsal process and production meetings the stage manager takes notes uh, and the stage manager is sitting right next to the director or the asm the assistant stage manager and they put all this together why to present that to the production team as early as two o'clock in the morning, I, would, I wouldn't be up at two o'clock, but I get up at 7 a.m. and I get the production notes to find that we don't need a sword in act three, scene two. Uh, we need it in act three, scene three. Okay, so we changed it. Um, 
that's not important for me to know, but it would be important for the costume designer to know that that's a prop, that's a costume prop. Anything that's worn by an actor is a costume prop. Anything that the actor picks up that's not worn on his costume is the responsibility of the stage designer. That's how it is. And that's how it is in the uh, United Scenic Artists Union, the USA Union. Now you take a look at the props. I'm glad you brought that up. And here you could see if you could just swing to any one of them. These are torches that were held um, and we had battery operated flickering lights that would light up to kind of indicate that this is a night scene. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the furniture pieces that were used beyond the um, uh, the thrones, and I think you have a picture of that. The deathbed is that there somewhere, uh, Alex? Uh, it, it should be there, maybe not. <clears throat> well, that would be another particular type of uh, uh, furniture that was not the permanent structures of thrones and, and, and benches and so forth. What we're looking at is an ongoing process of communication between backstage techies, which are including stage managers and all the assistants, and the design team. We have to know what we're creating, how we're creating it, and does it work? Now, this is the one area that pictures really are not going to show you. Uh, and that is, uh, and as, as he's showing you some of the behind the scenes construction work, which we'll be talking about uh, how the show is built. Uh, this, the, the shop was 45 miles away up in Gaithersburg, Maryland. So they were up there building things. I was in Rock Hill, South Carolina designing things and the director was in Washington DC <laughs> rehearsing things. And all three things are going on at the same time, which can get sometimes convoluted. Uh, but when we get to the final product, we put all those parts together. And when you put all the parts together, we create what is known as the finished production opening night, preview night, whatever you call it, open to the public. Uh, we always have to, I don't know whether you have a close up of the floor or the uh, tapestry there, um, what the man was working on and they were painting it. I don't know if that's, the, the, mm, is that it? Uh, that might be it. Right to your left there. That might be it. Yes, that's that's close enough. Uh, what I'm looking at is the the artist rendering and everything I've done. It's all it's all graphed out in two foot squares. Um, and you could see some of the artists working on that right there, creating that. Uh, and you have a charge artist, um, and you have several you have a uh, several other artists working under his control, under his guidance. Uh, there's a painter schedule, which you don't have, um, but there is a paint schedule, and it indicates everything has to be painted in one week, and it explains how many artists are doing it from a nine to five basis. And if there's an overtime, how much is that charge going to be? For some of you techies that want to know uh, how much money you can make if you join the IATSE union, uh, if you get there, it, it, you, you have to be nominated and then you do an apprentice for, I don't know, I think it's one year. Uh, I don't remember exactly. Uh, and uh, once you uh, get the your union card and you start working in various aspects of production. If you're working as a scenic artist, um, uh, as a technician or as a carpenter, uh, the rates vary. Um, basically, if you're working behind the scenes and you're trying to support one person on stage at the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC, for an example, it takes 12 minimum technicians to support one person sitting in a chair. And that, I think that, that price is probably like about $32 an hour per person. Uh, and after the uh, a normal working day, it's time and a half. I don't know why theater always goes to the time and a half, but it does. So you can make a lot of money if you have a show that is running for two or three weeks and you 
are doing not a whole lot backstage, but what you do do when it's your time, it's got to be perfect and exactly when it's supposed to happen. Same thing happens behind the scenes when you're preparing scenery or costumes and building these things. Uh, so you are uh, hourly, but yet part of a union uh, and, and you're guaranteed minimum uh, uh, salary. And if you are not anywhere near a restaurant, um, all that is provided. So everything's catered. That was the best part I like uh, is to have catered uh, lunches because they, they, they would give you some very good delicious food for that. Uh, so, you know, that's a glimpse of everything uh, that goes on uh, behind the scenes. And again, I apologize. I had all, well, as it works out, Alex had about two thirds of what I was going to give you. Uh, when we talk about the world of stage design, uh, we talk about research and behind me is some of my, my wall. I have about a 20 foot wall and it's floor to ceiling, 10 feet high, full of books. These are art books, these are theater, these are art, these are uh, humanities, these are, these are things that I look for. So, oh yes, I saw that somewhere and I'll find it. Oh, it's, it's a piece of artwork that I need that's gonna tell me that it's about Renaissance art or that it's early 19th century. Uh, architectural books. Um, uh, you know, having a degree in architecture helps, uh, so you know, I know how to think about structural engineering. Um, but you're, if it's something that is significant, I always have a caveat there. I have a release, and you have, it has to be checked out by a structural engineer. Because scene designers have to build sometimes uh, platforms and, and things, and sometimes they'll have to build bridges and it's got to hold 10 people and they're 30 feet in the air, you know? So, you know, all these things you're talking about safety and safety regulations. Uh, OSHA is part of this and the fire department gets involved with the fire marshal to make sure everything is flame proof and it goes on and on and on and on. So you have to know all these things uh, before you even can think about being creative. The real fun part of, for me, is actually the initial quick sketches with my 4B graphite pencil, or I like to use Prismacolor pencil a lot because I could sketch it really quick on some pebbled mat board. Uh, and I do these and I'll do sometimes what they call a storyboard where you'll have uh, maybe 10 or 20 different scenes and you do little character studies of these things. Um, that's the fun part. And then you, I guess you haggle <laughs> with the director about what you really, you got to have, you got to have it, and you got to convince it. And then they finally say yes or no. Most of the directors I've worked with always would say yes. And they are always happy they did say yes, because I'm here to try and make the director's job a little easier. Uh, they don't have to think about the environment. That's what I do. Uh, they can have input just like I have input into their blocking and action. Um, and uh, so we need to always remember that the world of design, production design is collaborative. The world of theater is collaborative. And that is very critical in thinking um, when you wanna pursue this as a profession. Now, how long does it take to get there? Uh, Building this show, uh, this was a 24-day build. From the first approval, incidentally, uh, as soon as the director puts the signature, that's it. You can't change it. And if you do change it, it's got to be confirmed with the designer, period. And if he says no or she says no, it ain't going to happen. So once that signature gets there, that's passed. Materials are ordered. Staff has assembled um, a, a stage house, scenic house is acquired to build it with a technical director uh, in charge and their carpenters and their <clears throat> scenic artists and all the other, the props artisans are there and they build it. At the end of 24 days, we go to load in. Uh, and that load in on the 25th day, at least this was a, a one day and one night load in. So it was about a 16 hour load in. 
everybody goes home, gets a good night's sleep, comes back for the first rehearsal. Uh, and this is sort of a, a rehearsal to get acquainted. It's a tech rehearsal where everybody gets acquainted with the environment and you know, how this is all going to work out. That's terrific. Then when that's over, um, we make some minor changes and modifications. And then you go into the beginning of what they call the full rough tech rehearsals. And every organization has a different setup. Uh, here, there was three technical rehearsals. No, I'm sorry. Two technical rehearsals, two dress rehearsals, and a preview, and then opening, and that's it. Um, the actors equity uh has certain regulations and it's these people many of these people were uh equity actors and some were um apprentices like you would be if you were getting into the iotsa union so there's regulations that stop you from working more than x amount of hours or x amount of minutes in one hour uh, and so the that has to be planned out now, where does the scenic designer come in? Well, my contract varies. I didn't have to be there uh, other than the last two uh, dress rehearsals. Uh, and I made it known that that's what I was gonna do. And uh, you know, you can make these negotiations well in advance. So when I went there for those last two dress rehearsals, uh, uh, and before the first dress rehearsal that I was going to see, I'd come in early and the uh, uh, the stage manager and the <clears throat> assistant ASM would walk me through and I'd be talking to one of the technicians or the scenic artists and I'd say, okay, this isn't quite what I want to happen. Can, can you do this or can we change that or there's something not correct on that banner? Can we, can we do something with it? Uh, or the, you know, the little tassels are not right can we change the color tomorrow from gold to red or something incidental things that the designer has the right and prerogative to to make suggestions and if it's possible they try to accommodate the designer now I hate, then, I hate to, uh, yes cut you off um just for That's time okay. purposes was there any final remarks or if anyone has any questions that has joined us um that they can ask you in the meantime um by chance i don't know if mayuko or brenda if you had any questions i'm here <laughs> yeah so I, I hate to cut you off because this is obviously a lot of information and yeah, i mean there's a lot that goes into this and i think a lot of us know that um and a lot of different aspects that I've, i'm sure people are not fully aware either whether it's collaborating with costumes and lighting design and how everyone kind of collaborates in that um so thank you again for for joining us and sharing your expertise um, and this insight on like set design. Um, if you had well, any final you know, remarks for anyone that potentially like would like to get into this or considered getting into this. Yes. Uh, first, thank you, Alex, for, for uh, thinking on your feet or I guess at the computer real quick and pulling up some of these images. That does help a lot. Um, and uh, I'm sure this will be resolved in our next session. What we don't finish today, I'll throw in a little bit of that and we talk about the uh, the technical background. Um, again, folks, uh, if you have a desire and a, and a true desire to continue in this field, uh, pursue it, uh, but do it with um, a sense of vigor uh, and, and caution. Uh, because it takes a lot of hours, a lot of knowledge that has to be obtained uh, to execute. Follow your intuition, follow your desires, follow your creative prowess. Those are things that really make a good artist. Uh, it's not about solely about, all right, can I survive? It's what you internally want to do and create. There are many designers out there. There are thousands of them and they're all working. There are many costume designers and lighting designers and scenic designers. It's not just working in the theater. You could work in television. You could work in cinema. 
Uh, you could work uh, doing window dressing at Macy's, although Macy's closed right now. Uh, those people that do things at Macy's that do all the mannequins and all that, they are USA designers. Uh, you, you have to have a USA card in New York to, to do any set dress, uh, window dressing, believe it or not. Um, and once you get in there and you do your networking, you can be very successful and very profitable uh, for you to, to pursue. Uh, also, don't be afraid to accept a challenge. Don't be afraid to accept it. Uh, the best place to, to learn all this is right there at the Rock Hill Theater with, with everybody that is online now. This is where you can learn from the bottom up, learn all the avenues of production. Once you have acquired that and you go off to university setting or a professional theater or a, a regional theater or an equity theater, you begin to learn more of the ropes, the pros and cons of how to make all this work. But believe in yourself, have confidence, and trust your creative prowess. Let that guide you. These are my thoughts for you. Um, and, and always, always remember that when you produce something, when you design something, you always got to think as a visual researcher, you got to research and you got to read the, the, the dialogue, the play, and go beyond just what the script says. Think about what those characters are and who they are and the relationship and association with one another. Because theater is about man. It's about humanity. Uh, it's about history. Uh, it's about emotion. It's about psychology. Uh, it's about energy. Um, it's about everything. Uh, that's what makes theater so much apart from some of the other arts, that it's the immediate process that's happening before a live audience. Those 500 people are experiencing something that you're creating for them. When you close the door, the, that that's in the back disappears and all that happens before the stage is a new world. And you as a designer are creating that world. That I leave you uh, with, and hopefully I'll see everybody next week. Have a great week. Yeah, I wanted to say thank you again for joining us and for anyone that did join us on this call. Um, even if you're watching it live or replay again, thank you. Um, if you guys have any questions for Dr. Sabella, you can email me at alex at rockhilltheater.org. Um, and I can forward those questions to Dr. Sabella and get those answers for anyone that's watching this right now. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm really, re really ready to give answers to anybody who wants them. Uh, that's not a stock answer, but a real life answer to your query. Uh, and Alex is very good. We, we converse back and forth a lot with emails and I try to get back to him like the very next day. Yeah. So to view the schedule of any upcoming episodes for anyone that wants to follow this series of the Techie Trilogy. Um, or to see when we'll be back on stage, you can visit our website at rockhilltheater.org, and that's theater with an R-E. Or visit us on Facebook and Instagram at Rock Hill Community Theater, or Twitter at Rock Hill Theater. Um, just as a heads up, the views expressed as part of the program do not necessarily represent the views of Rock Hill Community Theater, um, it's volunteers or the board members, but again, we want to thank everyone. Thank you, Dr. Bradley Sabelli for joining us and we're excited for the next weeks to come. So take care, everyone.